my background is in crop ecophysiology. So basically we look at the crops and the environment and how they interact with nutrients and, and water as well. Um, I do a lot of research in the major crops here in the state, in soybean, corn, something in wheat, and some in other crops that, that we are seeing they can fit in the cropping systems, are, such as peas, you know, field peas. And my focus in general is in the nutrients in the crops, whether there are nutrients that are limiting to the crop, to growth or to produce yield. And not only yield, sometimes uh, we look at quality. In the case of uh, soybean, for example, there is a lot of focus in quality. So how much those nutrients can interact with the environment, with the water, and how that interaction leads to better yields or quality. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have Nicholas Cafaro Lamenza. He's an assistant professor in plant physiology, weeds, and production systems. Uh, is at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So we're going to talk about uh, nutrient dynamics and what's called echophysiology. So uh, thanks for coming, Nicholas. How are you doing? Thank you, Rich. Thanks for inviting me today, and I am doing well. Um, I am, as you say, at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, but I am based in a research station in West Central Nebraska. So it's West Central Research Extension and Education Center and I have research and extension appointment. So I, I work in both research and extension. Okay, what is your research about? What are you looking at right now? Well, I, my background is in crop ecophysiology. So basically we look at the crops and the environment and how they interact with uh, nutrients and, and water as well. Um, I do a lot of research in the major crops here in the state, in soybean, corn, something in wheat, um, and some in other crops that, that we are seeing they can fit in the cropping systems are such as peas, you know, field peas. And um, my focus in general is in the nutrients in the crops, um, whether there are nutrients that are limiting to the crop to growth or to produce yield. And not only yield, sometimes uh, we look at quality. In the case of uh, soybean, for example, there is a lot of focus in quality. So how much those nutrients uh, can interact with the environment, with the water, and how that interaction leads to better yields or quality. Okay, so what is the research angle? What are you trying to figure out that hasn't been figured out before? Well, right, uh, one of uh, my main research uh, has been done in soybean. And what we have seen is that there is some nitrogen imitation in soybean, which is something interesting. Uh, soybean is a legume crop. And I don't know if you Did know. Did you say there's, there's some fixation of nitrogen in soybeans? Is that what you said? Exactly, exactly. So that's that's the deal. So soybean is a legume crop and naturally can associate with some bacteria and in the symbiosis. And those bacteria will fix nitrogen for the plant and the plant will provide some carbohydrates to the bacteria. And those bacteria sleeps in the roots, in nodules, and, and they has a 
symbiotic relationship. However, what we found is that when we are pushing the system to very high yields, those bacteria are not being enough to fix the nitrogen that the crop needs. And eventually, uh, those crops uh, may need some extra nitrogen that can come up from a fertilization or from other sources, um, such as building up the soil nitrogen in the future or, or other biological products that can be used. So that's uh, one of the main research that they have done. And it's kind of controversial because uh, usually we think that uh, nitrogen fixation can do it all and you know it's kind of magic that they can fix all the nitrogen and there is no limit. And we found that there is some limit and when you push the system to very high yields, uh, nitrogen from the fixation is not being enough, even when it's a legume crop. So nitrogen fixation, I think happens a lot with peas or like what, what kind of crops are really good for nitrogen fixation and what's the implication of soybeans can do it a little bit? Well, the nitrogen fixation in general is great and it's in most of the legume crop are the ones that, so legume plants are the ones that can associate with the bacteria and fix nitrogen. There is some other ways of uh, nitrogen fixations that is not in a symbiotic way, but most of the nitrogen fixation in agriculture come from legume crops, such as field peas, chickpeas, lentils, soybean. So there are several crops that can fix some nitrogen. Now, why this is important, you know, having a symbiotic uh, association that gives you nitrogen to the plant, that means that the farmer doesn't have to buy fertilizer. So it's a great help. But again, what we found is that when we, you get to very high yield environments, especially in soybean, there is some limitations and those bacteria are not being enough. And the other thing that, that we have seen, and there is a lot of research ongoing on that, is that um, even when they fix nitrogen, uh, those legume crops, usually when you harvest them, if you harvest, they export a lot of nitrogen from the system. So that's the other point that, uh, that is very important to consider. Although they fix a lot of nitrogen, they produce protein in the seeds, and that protein is being exported from the system. When I talk about the system, I am, I'm talking about the, the, the plant soil system. So if you look at the field, you have a plant that is fixing nitrogen, so it's incorporating nitrogen to the system, but then you are harvesting the seed out of the field. And when you do a balance, uh, usually that balance uh, gets a bit negative in terms of nitrogen, um, or in some cases it gets to zero. Well, I know that some people use nitrogen fixers as cover crops, and then they'll grind them back into the soil. So I guess the nitrogen doesn't leave, and then they'll plant other crops on top of them. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So when you use the legume crops as a cover crop, you know that's a good way to incorporate nitrogen to the system because you are not taking that nitrogen that is fixed, it's not, taking, it's not being taken up out of the field. Um, there may be some cases when you do grazing that you could extract some of that nitrogen, but usually when you are using, using a cover crop, that nitrogen will remain in the field until the following crop will pick it up and uh, you will export that nitrogen with the seed. Maybe a good thing to do is um, a crop rotation of well. Let's say you're growing peas and you're growing soybeans. If you leave maybe 5% of the soybeans, grind them up and then put them on the pea field and do the same with the peas. You know, save, let's say, 5%, grind them up and put them on the soybean field. I guess maybe they could actually keep nitrogen in there to reduce fertilizer use. And it would be some sort of uh, crop rotation and adding nutrients that aren't there. Would that work? But, yeah, that's the other part that I am working, you know, in the crop rotations. For example, here in West Central Nebraska, especially in the dryland, so there are different type of system, right? Uh, there are some irrigation, especially here in Nebraska, some dryland systems. And even in irrigation, you have some irrigated system that you can you know, irrigate as much as you want, but other systems that you cannot irrigate much and you have allocations. And then you have the dryland part uh, that in the eastern part of the state, it rains a lot, so you have some sort of cropping systems that um, you can get more crops or in the rotation and produce more. And then in the western part, it's a little bit more challenged because it's more dry. And, and what happened in this region uh, where I am now is that usually in the dry land, you look and there are all only grasses. There are no legume crops. So in the crop rotation, it, it's, it's sometimes difficult to 
keep a good rotation. And, and there is a reason for that. You know, the low water makes the legumes uh, not very easy to survive in this environment. But as you mentioned, you know, having a good crop rotation, it helps to keep a good balance between the nutrients. Um, when you rotate legumes and, and grasses, you can, you know, one crop will extract some of the nutrients and other crop will extract other nutrients and they will compensate a bit uh, in the way that they uh, export nutrients and leave residue in the ground. So uh, those are options that we are analyzing for, for the area as well, the crop rotation. But again, you know, farmers, they have to be profitable. So it's not all about playing with the rotation. It's something that in the balance has to be profitable and sustainable as well. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now back to the show. What location for soybeans that they um, they do fix some nitrogen? Does that mean like farmers are over fertilizing them? Or would they get better performance if they back off on it? Like, what have you learned from this? Could you repeat the question, please? Because soybeans fix nitrogen, are farmers unintentionally over fertilizing their fields when they grow soybeans? Oh, no. Actually, it is not common to apply nitrogen fertilizer in the soybeans. So you can apply other fertilizers. Usually farmers apply, for example, phosphorus, sometimes sulfate, but usually they don't apply nitrogen because we have that assumption that the nitrogen fixation will fix all the nitrogen for the soybean. So what we are seeing now that perhaps in the future, if we keep increasing the yields, we will need some extra nitrogen, either from fertilizer or from other biologicals that will fix that extra nitrogen for the plant. But right now, it's not that growers are over applying in the soybean, they may be over applying in other crops such as corn. That's a big issue here in, in Nebraska, uh, nitrogen in the groundwater, not in soybean right now. Yeah, I mean, what happens when you use, let's say you're using um, man-made fertilizers on crops that already fix nitrogen, does it over nutriate them? Like what does it do to them? Does it harm them? Um, no, actually uh, there is a trade-off between the nitrogen fixation uh, any nitrogen from the outside, like from the soil or from applying fertilizer or synthetic or uh, even biological fertilizer. So it's a biological trade-off. So the plant always prefer the nitrogen that is easily available in the soil, whether it's nitrogen from mineralization or from the fertilizer that you apply. And then if there is no more available there, it will pull from the nitrogen fixation. Why is that? Well, in general, the explanation is that it's cheaper because for the nitrogen fixation, the plant has to give some carbon to the bacteria to fix that nitrogen. In the other way, they just pull it out from the soil whether it, when it's available. So in general, the plant will absorb any nitrogen that is available in the ground and, and then after will pull from the nitrogen fixation. So that means that if you are applying fertilizer in the soybean, usually the nitrogen fixation will be reduced. Does it make sense? Yeah, but if you have reduced biological activity in the soil, won't the soil suffer or the crop suffer? No, we, because we'll compensate for the fertilizers that you apply. For example, if the crop needs 100 pounds of nitrogen and that 50% is fixed by the bacteria and the other 50 come from the ground, if you apply 20 pounds of nitrogen, the 100 will be dividing 50 from the ground, 20 from the fertilizer, and 30 from the plant, from the fixation. So it will reduce the fixation, but it will compensate. It will not decrease the 100 requirement. Does it make sense? Is there any trade-off to doing that? I mean, you have to be very careful about how much nitrogen you use as fertilizer, or can you use like a reduced NPK mix where you have less nitrogen so that 
you know the plants are going to fixate some. I mean, what, what do we do with this knowledge? How do you make efficiencies better? Well, initially, you don't want to apply any nitrogen fertilizer in the soybean unless you need it. Okay, so that's the first thing. Nitrogen fixation will do the job. And if you are in high yield environments, we may need some extra nitrogen. However, the, the big thing that we don't know yet is how do we detect that nitrogen limitation? And that's something that we are working on. How do you detect the fields that they will have nitrogen limitation? And then even if we detect that nitrogen limitation, it's very important that if you are planning to apply that nitrogen, you need to be very careful on the timing and the amount that you are applying. You don't want to apply a high amount to reduce much the fixation because we want to conserve the fixation and we want to complement the nitrogen fixation. And then the timing is very important because depending on the timing, it will be absorbed by the plant and it will reduce possibilities of decrease that nitrogen fixation. And we found that so far the best timing for not decrease much the nitrogen fixation and, and perhaps uh, get a good uptake by the plant is around flowering, but only in high yield environments. All right, so you let the nitrogen fixation happen first. And then can you tell that it's not enough? Is there a drop off that you see when you know, okay, now is the time to add the exogenous fertilizer? Well, we are not able yet to tell that. Uh, all the research that we have done is uh, you know, over applying some fertilizer and seeing some responses. And, and we have analyzed and, and seen that in, in environments that usually yield uh, more than 70 bushels, there is some limitation. Uh, there is a range of limitation, but we are not able yet to detect which fields will respond. Like we don't have a diagnosis tool, we are working on it. And there are a couple of things that we are looking uh, we are looking at the nitrogen concentration in the different uh, plant organs. So we we check nitrogen concentration in seeds and nitrogen concentration uh, in the stems, in the leaves, um, in the pods, uh, to see if we can uh, see a drop in that concentration in comparison with the treatment that has a lot of fertilizer. And then uh, there are some images that we are taking also with drones uh, with vegetation indexes to see if we can predict that limitation early on so that way farmers can have a tool to decide whether they, they fertilize or not the soybean. Right now, we don't have a diagnosis tool to recommend that fertilization if needed. Well, what tells you that the fertilization is needed? Are there any signs? Well, we did a lot of experiments here in the U.S. and in Argentina in which uh, we apply nitrogen fertilizer in soybean and they yield more and they produce more protein. However, the amount of fertilizer that we apply to get that for the extra production in that extra protein uh, was not profitable because it was experimental. So that tells you about the limitation. Now, and, and the extent and the severity of that limitation. Now, how we fix that limitation it's something that we are studying right now. All right. So in addition to soybeans fixating some nitrogen, what are some other interesting things you found from your research? Well, besides that, um, right now I'm, I'm in a, a cropping system position. So I work with different crops. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of my first year of this job. So I am launching some research. But with these experiments with soybean, we also found some cases, some high nitrogen concentration in the water, some high sulfate concentration in the water. And that was interesting because, for example, some growers were applying sulfur and not accounting for, for that uh, sulfur in the groundwater. And when we, when we show that to growers, uh, they were very interested. And in some cases, they reduced the application of sulfate because they didn't know that they had a big source of sulfur in the groundwater. So I think that that was a good discovery and we are working on more research on that to see if there are more responses uh, to sulfur and also how to make a good balance between the sources and requirements of the crops. Well, what's the concept of you know, extra sulfur being in the ground, in the groundwater, I'm sorry? Well, not necessarily a consequence. Uh, there's more consequence for the nitrogen, I would say, uh, in the groundwater. In the case of the sulfur, basically you are applying a nutrient that you don't need, so you can save money for a farmer. 
So that's uh, the, is the profitability, the time, um, and the use of resources, I think, are the most important things. Uh, for example, I had a farmer that uh, he called me one day and, and he was applying um, 40 pounds of uh, ammonium sulfate. In, and he said, you, you, you told me that there is a lot of uh, sulfate in the water, so should I be applying? And I say, well, you can sit in the office and turn on your pivot and go one and a half, and, and you're going to be applying the same amount of uh, sulfate that you're applying with the 40 pounds of AMS. So when he saw that, uh, he decided to not apply, and, and he's not having any issues, and he saved money and time and, and resources. So that's kind of uh, what we found in that case. This is an example. Is there so? What's the benefits again of extra sulfur in the groundwater, and what's the detriments? If you could just summarize it. Well, this there's uh, the benefits for the farmers is that they don't have to apply that that extra sulfur. We don't want the sulfur in the water. We don't want to have extra sulfur in the water. So there is no probably benefits uh, for drinking water with extra sulfur. The thing is that the farmers they that they irrigate if they have sulfur in the water they don't need to apply that to the crop if the crop is not required that much so that's kind of the benefit for the farmers saving some fertilizer knowing that they have that resource they are available and they don't have to buy that fertilizer so i guess the better your analytical methods to see what's in the soil what's in the water you know what can the plant do on its own all this will make it a lot more tailored and custom and will probably improve efficiencies a lot more in yields, right? Yeah, well, we, well usually what I like to do is uh, I like to see the context. So that's uh, that's why I'm, I'm saying, you know, looking, we look at the crops, but we look at the inputs and the outputs. So what are the inputs? Well, if we are looking at the nutrients, where those nutrients come from, uh, the easy way to see it is uh, they come from the soil. But well, we apply some fertilizer as well. We have some water that the water, the groundwater, carries some nitrogen, sulfate, potash. You know, there are some nutrients in the water as well that we have to account for. And then we need to account for for all the nutrients that we export, either in the seed or, for example, in some cases like silage. You know, you export a lot of nutrients in the whole plant because you are cutting the whole plant that is fresh plant, it's not even dry, and you are cutting up and exporting from the field. So what I do is I, I take samples from the groundwater, irrigation water, I take soil samples. Also, I do plant samples. And I look at the nutrients in the different parts. And also, we have management information for the farmers so that where they can tell us how much fertilizer they put and, and which concentration of nutrients they have. So by looking at the whole um, story, what are the inputs and the outputs, you can have a better balance and a better idea of what's going on and how the nutrients are moving through the system, whether they are being mainly exported, they are being increased in the ground, or or you are lacking of some of the of the nutrients. Um, how much room is there for improvement in efficiency and yield and you know using less nutrients, et cetera? Like do you see it a lot, or is this just little tweaks, a few percent here or there? There is, I think there is a lot to improve. It is a, it is a challenge uh, because uh, when you see it only in the physiological way, yeah, there is a lot of room to improve efficiency. However, the real world is more interactive in, in you know, when you put the economics, the environmental footprint and all that stuff, it gets a bit more complicated. So I think there is a lot of room to improve, but by integrating all the components of the sustainability. And for example, crop rotations, and how do you change your nutrient management in different crop rotations in, in a way that, that they are sustainable economically, environmentally, and also for production, producing enough food. So there is a lot of room, I think, for improvement, especially in the nitrogen part. We are still a long way to go to really, you know, be more efficient in reducing the amount of nitrogen that is going to the groundwater. Mm, okay. Does anyone harvest nitrogen from runoff or any other um, fertilizer components? Have you ever heard of someone doing that? Is it worth it? Um, 
there are a lot of uh, farmers that they use cover crops to not necessarily to harvest the nitrogen for the runoff, but to reduce the runoff. That eventually they will harvest the nitrogen and and keep it there in the ground. Um, so what they do is when they have a very slopey terrain and they have to especially till the field, uh, there are a lot of growers that they incorporate, you know, cover crop and 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 that way they can hold the ground and you know don't let it run off. So that's uh, one of the good things that uh, people are doing to reduce the runoff in those cases. How come no one talks about phosphorus or potassium, always nitrogen? What, are they not needed very much? Or, you know, the, I mean, I would think the soil probably has a lot of potassium and, and uh, phosphorus in it, but what, what do you see? Well, the, the dynamics, of, especially of phosphorus, is different. So the nitrogen, and the, well, especially the nitrogen, is very mobile. So it can go to the groundwater and and cause uh, some health problems. But in the case of the phosphorus, usually stay in the ground, and and usually there there are limitations in in some cases. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a less mobile nutrient in the ground, um, and less amount needed, I would say, in general, in comparison with nitrogen. They interact nitrogen and phosphorus. So if you have a phosphorus limitation, usually you, you don't have a good response to when you apply nitrogen. So those are interactions that usually we look. So when when you are applying, when a farmer is applying fertilizer, usually they want to have a good phosphorus level to have a better response to the nitrogen. Otherwise, they will have to over apply nitrogen to come up with the same yield, and that's not good. But the main difference is is that the phosphorus is, is less mobile. They are very interested in the phosphorus as well. And the phosphorus is something that normally is applied uh, as a base fertilizer early at planting. I see, I see. What about the potassium? How does that interact with you know the other nutrients in the plants? Okay, potassium, for example, in the soils that we have here in Nebraska, in the majority of the cases, there is a there has been a big source of potassium for the Kind of parental material of the soils. So the soils naturally has a lot of amount of, of potassium. However, with the demand of the new crops that they are genetically improved and they pull up a lot of nutrients, uh, those nutrients start to be in a bit limited in some environments. Especially when you pull a lot of a lot of nutrients with silage, for example, or when you harvest. Uh, um, let's say alfalfa for hay or things like that. Uh, those are nutrients that start to appear in those systems a bit more kind of limiting. But in general, based on the parental material of the soil, the potassium was not being much limiting until now that in some cases it start to appear in combination with the high demand from the crops. Um, other nutrients, uh, sulfur, in some cases is, is limiting. And that has to be with the change uh, in the uh, sulfur deposition. So in the old times, a lot of industries, uh, they have, uh, they produce a lot of uh, sulfur. They went to the air and with the rain, that sulfur came back. So also the, the chemicals that were applying in agriculture had a lot of sulfur. Right now, all that has been reduced for the industry and for good. So you don't have that much sulfur deposition in the uh, in the fields, and the crops keep still exporting a lot of sulfur. So that means that over the time, in some cases, the soil has been exporting a lot of sulfur and not putting it back. So in those cases, in, uh, there are some places, especially in dryland fields, uh, where you don't have that extra sulfur that could come in some cases from the irrigation, where you could see some limitations in sulfur. Um, did I answer all the questions there? Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Interesting. Have you run much into uh, regenerative farming methods that are trying to use, you know, no-till and no exogenous fertilizers? And, uh, you know, does that play at all into your research? Well, the name uh, regenerative agriculture, uh, I think it has been changed in a lot of names. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I have been um, into that. Not necessarily not applying fertilizer. I think not applying fertilizer 
In that case, it will be more organic system. The regenerative agriculture, right now there are different thoughts, uh, but yeah, the no-till in this area is very common and, and very useful, especially for the conserving the water, okay? And, and to let, uh, you know, to keep the ground and when there is high winds, if you till, you know, it, it can blow off. Uh, so the no-till is very important here in the area where I am right now. Um, and I have been involved in that too, in, 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 in some no-till versus strip till um, kind of practices. Uh, now, reducing the amount of fertilizer, um, this is kind of an ideology. So the plants need nutrients, and those nutrients has, has to come from somewhere. They can come from fertilizers, like synthetic fertilizers. They can come from biological fertilizers. They can come from the groundwater. They can come from the air uh, in some depositions. But those nutrients have to come somewhere for the crop to be absorbed. If those nutrients are not available, the crops are going to be limited. What can happen if you produce a low yield crop? Perhaps you have enough available nutrients, but in the long run, those nutrients are going to be scarce. So always those nutrients have to come from somewhere. In the regenerative agriculture, usually in the cases that I, I am working, they are not necessarily looking to not use fertilizers, but to reduce the amount by making the uh, nutrients from the soil a bit more available. By, by doing a good balance of the nutrients that are coming into the system and going out to the system, by making priorities of which are the nutrients that I am not inputting to the system and, and I am exporting uh, too much. So that's uh, kind of the work that I am doing with some growers that are focusing in the regenerative agriculture. So what are some of the KPI, the key you know, parameters that you're looking to optimize in a, in a crop grow, and how much improvement do you think you can get with these methods of monitoring and efficiency? Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah, what are, you know, um, maximizing yield or improving efficiency, like, you know, percentage-wise, how much improvement do you think can be achieved for the average farmer that grows, you know, the, the, the crops that you're working on, soybeans, peas, et cetera? Like, you know, can they double? What they're getting in terms of yield or efficiency, or is it only maybe a couple of percent? What do you think is possible? Uh, yeah, so uh, double the yield, I would not say that. Uh, there may be some specific cases in which uh, the yields are too low and they could double the yield. Um, I would say that in between uh, 20 or 30 percent, in most cases, could be improved. But there are some very you know proactive growers that they are already there improving a lot the efficiency. And when you when you go there to those systems, there's not much improvement. Um, they there may be, you know, in the product looking at the five percent of improvement. But in most cases I would say you can improve between the 20, 30 percent deficiency. That's a lot. Okay. Excellent. Well very good, Nicholas. Where can people go to find out more about your research? Well, you can uh, look at the University of Nebraska webpage and you can find there my, uh, my name and send me a message or by email at nicolas.cafaro at unl.edu. And I will be happy to answer any questions or launch any uh, on-farm research or experiment that you want. So happy to be there. Well, very good. Nicholas, thank you for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Rich, for reaching out and hope uh, you have a good day and, and people enjoy the information. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.